And so Romans chapter 8, verse 24 through 27, these are some very difficult verses, and uh, not much is said about them. And I want you to take, try to take a good look at them. Uh, we find that uh, in uh, verse 8 now, I mean verse 23 is our real key to this. And not only they, but uh, ourselves also. Let's see. Let's go off here. I talked to him about getting uh, uh, the internet stronger up here that we could get on. And so we did just recently. And that popped up there showing the who just came on Skype from that. But it says in Romans 8, 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grow within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to win the redemption of our body. Now we talked about they as talking about the lost and the animal kingdom are groaning and anticipating the time when that uh, uh, we'll have the rapture and uh, our bodies will be changed, the dead in Christ will be raised, and then we will be changed. And uh, uh, then we'll be taken out and come back seven years later for the thousand year reign. And uh, this is a tremendous thing as we look at that verse again. And where we have the first fruits, uh, we've grown ourselves waiting for the adoption. That's at the time of the rapture. Talked about the redemption of our bodies. When you ask God to forgive you to save you by the blood of Jesus, your soul is saved. Your body is still in that position of dying, sick, old, and so on, it will be redeemed at the time of the rapture. Where those who have died, their bodies will be raised. Those of us that are alive will be changed quicker than you can believe your eyes. Then we'll come back with Jesus seven years later to this earth. And to live here on this earth for 1,000 years in our resurrection body. And this is something to wait for. My word, tremendous blessing this is, an exciting thing that is involved with us. So these next two verses is talking about this waiting. Uh, the fact that we are waiting for this great event to happen, the rapture for our bodies to be either raised or changed, depending on whether or not we have thrown on here the Lord early, or whether it's at the, that time on that. And so uh, we're saved by hope. Now this is uh, in verse uh, 824. It says, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why do it yet hope for? Now this poses a, a great question about we're saved by hope. Now we're saved by grace. There's a difference between grace, faith, and hope. Faith is where you believe God. You trust God. Though you don't see it, you believe God. And it's a reality in your life. Grace is unmerited favor. Hope is looking with excitement about something that's coming, like our kids hope for Christmas. The closer it gets, the more excited they get on that. Uh, we have uh, different events that might happen in our life, and the closer we get to it, we hope for that event to happen. That means we're looking for it. Once it happens, we don't hope for it anymore. See? That's what it's talking about here. The hope that is seen is not hope for what a man sees, but he can hope for it. We have something that, so this word save is not really talking about our salvation. The word save is in reference to the redemption of our bodies, as we see in Romans 8, 23, where it talks about that uh, we've grown within ourselves, waiting, that's what that word hope means for, for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And so this is an exciting thing, and when Christians do not have this background, they miss that hope. They miss that excitement in life. All they can do is just try to uh, exist until they go home, until they die. Okay. Uh, one thing that's really helped me on that is that the hope as used in the Bible is confident expectation. Yes. Exactly on that. Now, my soul <coughs> is saved now. My body will be saved. Let's see, I want to show you the difference that when the Savior is talking about our, our bodies being raised and not our soul. Our soul is saved now. Our bodies will be redeemed and will be wasted. In John 5, 24, very, very, I say to you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Now let's take a look at that. A person without Jesus is condemned. 
Once you trust Christ as Savior, it's not condemned, and he has everlasting life. Now in this, Jesus said, Very, very, now I say to you, He that heareth my word and believeth from him that sent me, does it say, shall have, will have? No, he has everlasting life. At that moment that he believes, he has everlasting life. At the age of nine, I prayed and asked God to forgive me, saved by the blood of Jesus. At that point, I had everlasting life. I have it now. It's everlasting. I don't lose it. And what would you believe? So I'm not hoping for my salvation. I have my salvation. Are you getting the picture next to uh, We're hoping for the redemption of our body. I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to that. But I have salvation. And then it goes on to say in that verse, just to remind you, and shall not come into condemnation. You cannot lose that everlasting life. Or it wouldn't be everlasting, first of all. It wouldn't be eternal. It's everlasting on that. And Jesus said, you shall not come into condemnation. If you can lose it, then you'd be condemned again. Jesus said, you can't do that. Anybody that says you can lose your salvation is calling Jesus a liar. And i got news for you. Jesus said a lie. That all men be liars and God be true. And then, and then it goes on to say, it gives assurance, Jesus said in that verse, but it's past, P-A-S-S-E-D, from death into life. Now that's not shall pass or will pass, but it's past from death unto life. Or death. And so once you ask God to forgive you to save you by the blood of Jesus, now I think that's it. Oh, that's not it. That was last week. Yeah, that's last week. Here's And so we find that uh, once you uh, accept Christ as Savior, you pass the <coughs> SSED for death, not shall pass, not passing, you're not in the process of it, you've already passed from death into life. And so we're not hoping for salvation, we have that. Now again, to show you this, in 1 John 5, 11 through 13, and this is the record that God has given us, given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Now, it doesn't say this is the record that God will give us eternal life. He has given us eternal life. Those that have asked God to forgive them, say about the blood of Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Salvation is present. When we ask God to forgive us, you have it. You don't hope for it. Some people say, are you saved? I hope I am. Well, if you're not saved. You're either, yes, I'm saved, or I'm not saved. There's no hope about it. It's, it's a, a, an actual fact, the reality of that. These things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know we have the Bible to assure us that we know we have eternal life. Not that we shall have. So salvation by hope is not talking about our salvation of our soul. It's talking about the salvation of our body. And the redemption that is there. We, once we've made that decision, then we have eternal life. And the scriptures is there to assure us of that. And so my soul is saved now. My body will be saved in 2 Timothy 1.12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hallelujah. I know. I'm not assured we can have on that. No question, no doubt in that. And to get in the word of God and that assurance on that. And so uh, now we wait with anticipation hope for the redemption of our bodies. This is an exciting thing. And that first fruit, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. Now we talked about that last time. The animal kingdom is groaning because they're miserable until the thousand year reign when they'll no longer be at war with one another. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The lost grown, they know that they're, they're, uh, they've got a terrible body, they ache, they have pains, they fear death. See? 
And that's and that's a horrible state. Now, a child of God has part of that, but not much of it. When you have the knowledge of what's going to happen, that you're going to be raised, you're going to be changed, you're going to live on this earth for a thousand years, then you have a different groaning. You have that groaning of anticipation. Just like the kids. Man, can we open a gift today, three weeks before Christmas? <laughs> you know, uh, they're, they're anxious for it. They, uh, they go and they check the Christmas tree. They look at all the presents. I mean, every day, they're groaning and trying to figure out somehow or another to bring Christmas in a little early. Can we do it uh, on Christmas Eve? Can we do it Christmas Eve morning? My, my kids went through the whole bit. They've grown from the time it started getting near to Christmas time and we put the tree up. Their groaning kept getting louder and louder. Not that they were hurting. They were anxious to see what they were going to get and whether or not they were going to get what they wanted to get. And we ought to be excited and grow within ourselves. Man, <laughs> to know this old body is going to be changed. Amen. Do what you want to it now. It's going to be raised again. You can fill it full of cancer. You can shoot it. You can burn it. You can stab it. You can do whatever you want to with it. It's going to rise again. Man, that's an exciting thing that is there. And so, with that, this, for we are saved by hope. Let's talk about our body. But the hope that is not is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why is it yet hope for? So I've got my salvation. Lord, I'm hoping for that redemption of my life. For that thousand year reign. Man, what an exciting thing that is. So, we have something to look forward to in Romans 8, 24 and 25. For we're saved by hope, but the hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why did he have hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Now, here we are in this age, in this part, we've been born again. We're getting near to that time of the rapture. Amen. All the signs are fulfilled. It's time for Jesus to come. Man, he's late in that. And we're, we're, we ought to be excited not only of seeing the Master, but having that resurrected body. Being with our loved ones. I shared with you before, my grandfather raised by an old stone wall. And he wanted to show me that when I came to Aiden. And he died before I could get him up here. And after the rapture, I'm going to meet grandfather in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then seven years earth time, just a moment, heaven's time, I'm going to come back with granddad and we're going to walk an old stone wall together. Brother, that's something to hope for. That's something to be excited about. And that's just the drop in the bucket of all that we've got and that we can be excited about. And if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience and wait for it. Why right, any question at this point or comment? Don't say amen or huh. <laughs> Just bear down on the patience. Yeah. <clears throat> at uh, at this same time we're talking about all land will be present when you yes, when you yes. your body's gonna be home. Dead. Okay. He's got every hair in your head number. He knows where every part of you is there. And he'll bring it back together. And so no, that's the miracle of God. That's the blessing of God involved in that. Alright now, something to look forward to. When we have this in mind, when we know and understand today can be the day. I'm going to be glad that I'm going to be right. Today can be the day I'm going to get my body. And then just seven years, I'm going to come back and be on this earth again. When we understand that, then I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. All of the suffering that I go through now, man, it's going to be over with during this time. And not just being in heaven somewhere, but here on this earth. Now, sometimes I think about this, and well, we're going to have victory, but like a coach with a football team. And they tell the coach tells the team, they say, they say, you're the team out here. And I said, now, boys, we're going to win this football game tonight. No question about it. He said, I want you to play your best. You get out there and you really play good and follow your place. And man, we get out on the field and the game starts. And right off the bat, they make a touchdown on the other side. 
And then uh, a few minutes later, we fumble the ball, they pick it up, they make another touchdown. Now, but a couple more minutes along the line, something else happens, they intercept the pass, and they make another touchdown. We haven't made one yet. And man, they come back into the huddle, and I get in the huddle, and I tell you, I said, now, we're going to win, we're going to win. We're already three or four touchdowns behind. How can we win? We're going to win. By halftime, we are way, way behind. We haven't even made one touchdown. In the locker room, I'll assure you, we're going to win. We're going to win. Come almost to the end of the game. We haven't made one touchdown. They are about 50 to nothing in that. And I tell you, we're going to win. And so, just in the last two minutes of the game, I call timeout. I motion out on the field, and the bus comes out on the field. I tell you to get in the bus. All of you get in that bus. And then we drive off the field, we go to another football stadium. Nobody's there. I take you out of that stadium, out of that bus, and I give you the football, and I tell you, run across that goal. Make all these touchdowns right here, and you make them all, and we've got more touchdowns there than what the other has in the other place. That's foolish. That's what most people think, that you're going to win the victory when you get to heaven. We're fighting the game here. Amen. We're going to win the game on this field. Amen. That's what this is for. Are you getting the picture? We're going to win. I don't care how much you think the devil's got ahead of us. We're going to win here on this field. And I'll have to put you in a bus and take you somewhere else. It's going to be back here on this field. Man, that's exciting. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a, what a glorious thing. So, regardless of how we might, hardships we might have, this little body's going to be raised. Regardless of our limitations, this little body's going to be raised and like a glorious body, like the resurrected body of Christ. We talked about that earlier. And so that's our hope in this. Romans 5, 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Oh, I tell you, I'm, I'm in love. I'm not in love with a theology, and I don't serve a theology. I'm not in love with a religion, and I don't serve a religion. I'm in love with a person. Amen. 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 My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And He is cursed, and He is put down, and uh, uh, disgraced in every way that possible by the world, and by even of some of His own followers. Amen. Amen. I got news for you. I'm going to rejoice in the whole I'm going to be back here when Jesus comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's not coming back as a baby in Bethlehem. He's not coming back to be mocked. He's not coming back to be made fun of. He's coming back to reign in all of His glory, and I'm going to be with Him. Amen. Brother, that's hope. That's something we can rejoice in. So, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace, that's our salvation. Wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I'm going to be back in my resurrected body, reigning with Him, walking with Him. If, those, if that what I've got on has got any buttons on it, I'll pop every one of them. Man, I'm proud. I'm a child of the King. Amen. There's nothing going forward to. What a, what a hope we have in that. In Romans 15, 4. What, what sort of things we were written a fourth time? Start about the Bible. We're written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now I'll tell you right, right now, through the Bible, I am assurance that I am saved now. I don't have to hope for it. I don't look for it. I've got it right now. I have everlasting life now. So when it comes time and they think I'm dead, I'm not, I'm alive. Because I've got everlasting life. I'm just taking right off this old buddy. All of the statements of Jesus and Red. Yes. And but now also in this Bible, I have assurance and the knowledge of all that God is going to do <coughs> on this earth before it's destroyed. And man, it's not going to destroy. God will destroy it at the end of the thousand year. And then I'm going to have a new heaven, new earth. <coughs> Oh my! Through patience and comfort of the scriptures, I have hope. I have the truth of this. 
I don't care how bad our politicians mess things up. I don't care how bad the nations foul things up. I don't care how bad the whole world gets. I've got news for you. We're going to have a glorious time when the King of Kings comes. And we're going to reign with Him. And then, when Satan is loose, and one more time, this old world, along with Satan, is totally wiped out, done away with, and we'll have a new heaven and new earth. Brother, I, I've got, I can have patience with that knowledge. I can suffer through that. Whatever I have to go through is no big deal. Compared to this, I have hope from the Scriptures. I know that from the Word of God, not from somebody that had a vision, not from somebody that had a dream or anything else. I've got it directly from God's Holy Word. Isn't that great? I went to have guesswork about it. I was black and white, red and white. <laughs> red, black, and white. However, your Bible might be in there. Now, the God of hope feed you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, man. I don't care how things get during this time, I know the rapture's coming. <coughs> And I know that at that tribulation period that's going to be on this world, such as this never been anything like it before, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> and that's exciting. I know that. And then I'm coming back again. And I can live <coughs> now with that hope and anticipation of it by the power of the Holy Spirit. What an exciting thing to be. And every day is a new day. <coughs> Because I have hope in what God is going to do. Because I have experienced salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. What a, what a blessing it is. And so the God of hope filled you with all joy and peace <coughs> in believing. I don't understand all that. I don't, don't claim to. But I believe every word of it, whether I understand it or not. Amen. Amen. And what I know and can understand, I move in excitement of it. And then as he enlightens me more, and it gets more exciting. <laughs> what, a, what a tremendous thing this is. That's a time for that. Now in Colossians 1.5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now, normally we're thinking about, well, when I go back, <coughs> that's going to be a glorious thing. To see what's in heaven right now. And, if, and if, uh, if you could go with somebody or just think about it, what, what the Bible tells us, that in heaven you've got those who, who died in Christ. And they're there without their resurrected body. But also there's in heaven those that have their resurrected body. Moses had, uh, Gabriel went and uh, Michael from the wind got the body of Moses and he's got that. And then there's Enoch and, uh, uh, that was uh, walked with God and so on. Elijah that was taken up picture of the rapture involved in that and when will be changed. And then you've got those who are raised at the resurrection of Christ. Man, they're, they're excited up there. But if you got out there, you know what you'd find? They're packing. So what are y'all doing? So we're getting ready to go back to the earth. What do you mean going back to the earth? Just got here. No, we're going to go back and get our resurrected body. We're going to go back and not only that, then we're going to have the wedding. And then we're going to go back with Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, and their excitement. There's thrill about it. Man, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, wherever you've heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, and as sure as heaven is, sure as this is here. <coughs> we have that assurance. Man, what a, what a hope that we have in, and the anticipation of it. Times 2, 11 through 3. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And salvation is available whosoever will. So, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. Oh, hallelujah. Man, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Looking for the blessed hope, the rapture. What a blessed man. What an what a exciting thing that is. I know that I have believed. I know that I have everlasting life. And I anticipate, I hope, I have that assurance of the coming of my Lord and Savior 
and I will be taken out before the tribulation period, and then I'll be back here on this old earth to reign for 1,000 years with my loved ones. Not for 20 years or 30 years, for 1,000 years. Victorious. What a hope. What a surety we have. Then in Hebrews 6.18, that by two innumerable things in which it is, it is impossible for God to lie, we might have that we uh, we might have a strong consolation who has taken with you to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. This hope is sure and steadfast. God cannot lie. His word is final, it is true. You can rejoice in it. What a blessing. What an exciting thing. Man, what a passage that is here. And when, when you understand the difference in the part of that on there. Now, in 1 Peter 1 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again and to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Man, every time I read that, I, I, I get excited. Now, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Praise God for that. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness. Now, if Jesus would have just died on the cross and gone to heaven, we're still been saved. The blood was shed, and we have forgiveness through the shed blood of Christ. But he was raised from the dead to give us a lively, a living hope that we're going to be raised. Not just my soul is going to be saved, but my whole body. Everything about it is going to be redeemed. And what a glorious time that's going to be. And the rapture. That will come complete, and then I'll live in that assurance during the second coming and the thousand year reign of Christ. Isn't that a part of scripture, man? A lively hope, man. I love that, that phrase on there. And uh, into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To learn the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That means that you can face death without any fear. You can look at death as going to sleep at night. You can wake up to a glorious morning in heaven. And that's sweet. You don't have to be afraid of anything. There's nothing to be afraid of when you understand. And we have that hope and that assurance in that. And if Jesus would come now, man, we're going to skip that part. We're just going to pick it to complete your eye. Our bodies change and we're going. So wasn't the point that the man wants to die? Yes. When you ask God to forgive you and save you by the blood of Jesus, what happened to you? You died right there. You died right there. Your old man is crucified. If you already met that requirement. And now, I hope we're going to have the other one. Now, what, what a tremendous thing uh, this is on that. Then, in 1 John 3 and 1 and 3, Behold, what matter of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Man, you know, all God had to do just save us and not be part of His family. But He not only wanted to save us, He wanted us to be of His family. What matter of love? He wants to, that's a personal thing, not just a, something good to do for mankind. It's a personal thing. He wants you to be of His family. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew Him not. Beloved, now, now we are the sons of God, not in the future. Right now, I'm a child of God. And it does not yet appear when we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now I'm saved, but I know I'm going to have my resurrection body. I'm going to be like Him. So he had a resurrection body. I'm going to have a resurrection body. And every man that hath his hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Now hope 
And when you get into that hope, not only it's exciting and joyful, but it keeps you right with God. Now, there's two ways of using this illustration, and let me, but aboard our aircraft carrier, we have inspections once a month of all the sections of the ship. And uh, the captain would inspect one side of the ship, and the executive officer would inspect the other side. Then the next time, they switch. Well, at this point, I had been transferred out of the engine room up to the chaplain's office. And because we lost the Protestant chaplain, being a preacher, they put me up in there to answer the death calls and problems that the sailors might have for, for the Protestants in there. And uh, my duty outside of that was to, uh, I was in charge of the library. And so I would have to uh, stand inspection and be responsible for the library. Have you ever tried to clean a library? Now you got to understand on the ship, you don't have a ceiling tile like this. You've got these lights hanging down there and you can see the, the uh, chains going up there. You've got all the pipes in there for all the steam that's going on down through there. You've got everything exposed in there that you've got in the ductwork uh, in the ceiling. And then in there, the captain, when the executive officer would come by, he'd look in. Did a good job, Sailor. Thank you, sir. He never would hardly even walk in there. He just kind of stepped in and looked around. But the captain, no. That wasn't his way of inspecting. Now, I was taught to respect those in authority. And I wanted to please my captain. And that was that was it. And uh, so, but when the captain came in, he had two Marines with him. One of them carried a, a box of new batteries for his flashlight. The other one carried a box of clean white gloves for him to put on when he goes in to inspect. And he would come in and he would look around, he'd feel under here, and if this were lift up, he'd feel under there and see if there's any dust under that. The books, he would pull them out, run his finger on top of the page of the book, of the what's on that, and down the back side, and then stick his hand inside that and feel back there and see if there's any dust behind those books. He would go up and I mean every nook and corner that he could think that you might miss, he would check it. He would shine that flashlight in there, he would put that glove on, and I mean he would inspect every part of it. I didn't want to disappoint my captain. I had that library spotless before it was time. I looked down the passageway, Sometimes I couldn't see him, but I could hear the Marines hollering. Hey, Tom! Sometimes you'd hear those heels click together, those old Marines, and calling for attention. The captain would say, Closer to God, you know what I was doing? I was in there checking again. I mean, I was inspecting it over and over again. I was cleaning things and trying to find things I never thought of. I mean, if there was anything behind that, I was making sure, and anywhere, any place on that, the closer it got, the more I was doing it. Until the time came. My Lord is coming. He's greater than any captain. Yes, I was expecting our lives. And my life is clean by the blood of the Lamb. But I've kind of got it dirty. Time and time again. And praise God, I can go in and clean that up. I can repent of sin. I search things that no one else would even know about or even pay attention to. You might not think there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever, but I know my relationship with the Lord, and I come constantly, so I'm constantly getting that right. And I want my Lord to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. I want to clean it for Him. But then also, knowing that He's coming, I'm going to purify myself. More and more. That hope not only brings joy to me, but it keeps me straight with God. I don't have to worry about somebody coming along and saying, hey, what are you doing there? What's going on there? I don't need anybody to check on me. I've got the Lord doing that because of the hope that I have. And that assurance and knowing what's going to happen, that I'm going to purify myself. I'm going to constantly be examined everything that is there and getting it right with God. Repenting of it, asking God to help me, get it right, and to continue to be right. Man, what a glorious thing this is and what's happening on that. 
Right, you question up to this point. Yes, yeah. at the time of the rapture, when we meet the Lord in the air, will we meet in our resurrected bodies or just our souls? In your resurrected body. Now, at the rapture, Jesus comes and the soul and spirit of those that come with him, their bodies are raised, they're in the clouds. We were to alive, our bodies are changed, we meet them in the clouds. That's our resurrected body we're standing there with. And so we're together in our resurrected body on the cloud. We, we meet our friends. We recognize them. And then we go to meet the Lord in the air. And then once we meet the Lord in the air, the reason why we're doing that is because Satan has to be cast out of the air to the earth to start this tribulation period. And we'll do that. We'll cast Satan out. Once that's done, then we go before the judgment seat of Christ. That's when we give account of everything we've done since we've been saved. That's when we'll receive our crowns or our positions and our rewards. And that's when we'll know what we'll do during this thousand years when we come back from that. And so, our seed here, yes, we'll be in our resurrected body from then on. We'll never lose that body. It will always be, it's an eternal body. Never get old, never get sick. Now, so that happens at the rapture when we get this. And then uh, we'll come back and live. All right, another question. George, you have a question? Yeah. Really At the end of the thousand years, Jesus is king. If we are reigning with him, Satan has to be loosed for a little while. I think it's the way the scripture says this. Now, is why why do we have to why do, do we have to have a new heaven and a new earth, a new earth in particular? at that time. Is that the total defeat of Satan? Uh, or no. does Satan defeat Christ's work after the end of the thousand years? Well, uh, Satan, are we? Yeah, at, the beginning, at the beginning of this, Satan is put in the bottomless pit and bound for a thousand years. <clears throat> then he's turned loose at the end of this to uh, and goes out and deceives the nations. There are a lot of that are lost. They go for more battle and God just stops it. He destroys the earth and puts Satan in hell. Now, you have two problems with the earth, with what's going on. First of all, you've got the battle of, of Satan rebellion against God. Lucifer, he, uh, he rebelled against God. He's a, a cherubim. And he becomes the devil. A third of the angelic host follows him. So you've got this battle going on between God and Lucifer. Nothing to do with him. Whatsoever. Just just for you got that battle there. Now God creates man more than the angels to become of his family. And man, Adam, sins against God. And to redeem the soul of Adam, Jesus must die on the cross for our sins. Pay the price for it. That's to redeem us. It has nothing to do with Satan on that part. And you, you can't save Satan. You can't redeem the, the lost angels. Only mankind can be redeemed because we're the image of God. And so at the cross and all of this, uh, we've got a our relationship. Now at the same time, Satan is in charge of this world and tries to get mankind to worship him as God in there. And so his, now his reign is tied into mankind with that on, there, on this earth. All right? We find that through Jesus Christ, we can overcome the Satan. We have victory from Him. And then we find what Adam couldn't do during the, is during the uh, at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. Jesus comes back as the last Adam, and He completes that. He takes care of this world. He's King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and we reign victorious with Him amongst the lost. Amen. At the end of that, this completes the Jesus completes what Adam couldn't do. Adam failed to do. Jesus does in that he's obedient. Adam was disobedient. Adam was to take care of this whole world, the animal kingdom and all, and failed in that. Jesus does during this. Okay. All right? Then Satan, his battle comes to an end at this time. Both of these, man and, and the battle with Satan, that both of them end at the same time with this. And so God destroys this whole earth totally wipes it out and has a new heaven and a new earth, on that new heaven all the former things are passed away. Everything is done away with on that. 
and you start a brand new earth, on this new earth you have New Jerusalem as the capital city. And then you've got the saved living on the outside of the New Jerusalem and the bride of Christ living on the inside of New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is only 1,500 miles cubed on this new earth. You've got cities on the outside, nations on the outside, the revelation that deals with that. They're all saved people. There's no lost people on this new earth. Nothing that is rebellion to God can come to this earth. And so God's heaven, wherever it's at, is moved to this new earth. And so his throne, his headquarters is set up on this new earth. In heaven right now, Satan has been there. God called him in to talk about Job. Satan is there accusing us before God. Jesus is there to intercede for us at his right hand. And so heaven, in that sense, has been polluted. Now be careful about that. Don't go out and say, I think heaven is gone. No, because Satan has been there. So, on the new earth and the new heaven that is there, none of that will be there. Satan's totally just... He's, totally, he's in the lake of fire, burning for eternity. He cannot escape. He's there along with all of the lost. All of the angels that sinned against God, they're there. Everything is rebellion. Now, during this time, in Isaiah, the last chapter, it talks about that we will take the heavenly host from time to time on a tour of hell to show them if you rebel against God, this is where you go. Keep them out of there. So nothing that rebels against God will ever be on this new earth. And this is for all of eternity. And we'll run the universe from here. <coughs> Your key word up there is pure. How do you refine gold? <laughs> you burn it, you burn it until it, all the dross is gone and then it is 100% pure gold. No trace of any of the other contaminating elements. Well, Jerry, uh, when, at what point do we get to where we're no longer tempted or, or uh, at the rapture? At the rapture. So when we come back, in the thousand year reigns, Satan cannot tempt us. No, we're not. Okay. Our flesh is not going to bother us. Right now we have temptations from our flesh. Man, I shouldn't eat that cake. Nobody says, yes, he'll, he'll feel good. <laughs> you know, so we'll not have that problem. Doing that. But from then on, for all of eternity. We're complete at this point. <coughs> Up to this point, right now, only our soul is redeemed, our body and our spirit's got to be developed, and that will be done at the rapture. We're trying to discipline now. We tell our flesh, no, we're not going to do that. We, we train our spirit of what we need to know and how to do things. And at the end during this time, our spirit will be right with God, and our body will be in all. And so, no, you won't have that temptation during this house in your Once our flesh dies, that's the end of it. Uh, of the flesh. Yes, of the flesh, and it's brought back, it's raised. And so it is still the same size, same. You look like you do now, and you want to kill it. Well, it's flesh. It's, it's redeemed flesh. Jesus. You can eat, you can be touched, just like this flesh can here. So now, it depends on the definition you've got for flesh. Well, the ability to be tempted. No. Now that's done away with. Yeah. Not part of it's done away with, yes. But you'll have a physical body and be like what you want. Do you have a heartbeat? Yes. Yes. All of your organs will be functioning, yes. And you'll live for eternity. God does. Jesus does. And his body. And all that's it. God destroys the earth and he has a new heaven and a new earth. Where is Satan going to be? Is he going to be on this old earth? I no, no, it's not, but the old earth is, is wiped out totally. There's no place found for it. It's dissolved. Doesn't exist. He's in the eternal fire. He's in the lake of fire. Where is that going to be? Going? Somewhere in space. Okay. We don't know. Somewhere out of space. I thought maybe it might <coughs> designate the old earth as his place. The, I know hell is in the earth here, and it's going to be taken out and put in that lake of fire in Revelation. 
you know, go back to Revelation chapter 20 and read it there. It talks about hell is put in there. Earth is destroyed. So it's a, it's a that fire somewhere in outer space. We don't have any, we don't know where it's at on that part of it. But it's actually no cloud in that part. There's a few planets that would qualify. Yeah, a few planets that would qualify. <laughs> they could be on a sun, a sun, sun planet could have a sun that it would be on, you know, be involved with. You got billions of suns just in our, our, uh, uh, yeah. All right. Yes. During the thousand year reign, there will be no sin. No, there will be sin. We won't sin. The saved won't sin. But there will be lost people here during the thousand year reign will sin. Those are the ones we'll be working on. Yes. The devil is nowhere around. Yeah. The devil is not sin. <laughs> See, now, the devil is not sin. So the removal of the devil doesn't mean you remove sin. Sin is rebellion to God. The devil, Lucifer committed sin and became the devil. See? And so with the removal of Satan, it doesn't remove sin. Uh, sin is still in unregenerated hearts and rebellion to God. And you'll have lost people during this thousand years of uh, sin. They'll kill one another. There will be all kinds of crimes committed. There won't be any wars. We'll keep that from happening. So we'll try to witness to them. And then at the end of that, Satan comes out and deceives the lost people on this earth, which is as a number of the grains of sand. But the so you're going to have a lot of people that will not be seen. Especially down toward the end of it. Where there's going to be a volume of people watching. Mike, is that? Yeah, I was curious. I was going back to George's question about the devil being loose for a little while. Yeah. And that's at the end of this, and he deceives the nations of the lost. They take over for one more battle against Jerusalem, and God destroys the whole thing. Jay? Okay. I'm just going to say uh, the old saying of the devil made me do it is not correct. Exactly. On the new heaven and earth, if you if you want to eat bread, you can. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. That's right. You can do that during the thousand year reign. You can do that on the new heaven and new earth. Oh, oh, really? Yes. Yes. Man, that's the hope. See, that's the hope. That's that's what this in Romans we're talking about. This is the hope that keeps us going. Not just that I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to live again. And this is what's exciting and joyful. And and uh, uh, But if you had it now, you wouldn't be hoping for it. We don't have it now. We're hoping for it. I have salvation now, so I don't have to hope for it. But I'm hoping for this. And what God's talking about. That's what Romans 8 is dealing with. All of this stuff we talked in Romans 8 is built up to this. And this hope that we have there. Now, in that life, 